I'd like to welcome you to our guest lecture tonight. I'm trying something a little new and different. We have uh, one of our fifth year students, our thesis students, Craig Hartman, will introduce our speaker. Craig. Thank you. Our speaker tonight is noted as a teacher, a scholar, critic, competitor, and a very active and eminent professional. His education includes an undergraduate degree from Dartmouth uh, College and a graduate degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He has further participated in architectural education as an adjunct professor for the Cooper Union School of Architecture since 1959. As a professional, he is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects and, a, and he has participated as a member or chairman of, of many of the New York chapter policy making uh, committees. He is also currently serving as the New York uh, chapter vice president. Besides his involvement in the AIA, he has served on several uh, very prestigious juries, uh, such as the New York Municipal uh, Art Society Architectural Jury and the Reynolds Medals Architectural Jury. In addition to this uh, considerable activism in the profession at large, he has maintained a very dynamic practice through his own firm of Davis, Brody, and Associates. His firm's diversified work ranges from uh, studies for large-scale pneumatic uh, structural applications to such things as, as housing and urban renewal studies and projects. His work has been published consistently for over 20 years in virtually all of uh, the major architectural periodicals. Likewise, he has the enviable record of having been recognized with over 70 major awards and exhibitions. This includes an AIA Honor Award for the U.S. Pavilion at Japan's Expo 70. Last year at this time, we had the privilege of hosting him as a member of the accreditation team, and I'm sure that many of you are probably familiar enough with him to really require no formal introduction. So without further elaboration, I consider it uh, really a privilege to present Mr. Samuel M. Brody. Mr. Brody. Thank you. Uh, sounds like we're all ready for a big interview with that introduction <laughs> for a job. Uh, but it's very nice to be here again. Uh, last year, it was, uh, it was very exciting to, to come to Ball State, the new architectural school. We saw this space then, which was not in use, and we, all the members of the accreditation team, were wondering how the school would actually become active in the new space. We were all very impressed uh, at the time of our visit with the wonderful spirit and energy that the school had. And uh, my only advice is I hope you don't get too comfortable in your new quarters and lose any of that spirit that we saw back over there in the Quonset Huts, which was really quite exciting to see. Uh, after having been wined and dined so well this evening before this lecture, I, which reminds me of uh, when I was in school and we were, as a student, we went to hear a talk by Alvar Alto. Alto was just building at MIT the uh, dormitory, which was a strange curved form, all full of crazy angles and notches. Back at school at Harvard, we were doing very chaste rectangles at that time, and we couldn't understand this building. So we were very interested in hearing Alto talk and trying try to understand what he was doing. We all filled the hall. We waited 15, 20 minutes. Finally, Alto came in. He sort of found his way to the lecture platform and secured his way back and forth. He wove up and he stood here like this, and then he said, you know, the shortest way between two points is not always a straight line. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have such a succinct and profound summation of my experience uh, as Alto did. Uh, 
uh, that was really an excellent lecture. He sat down after that. Uh, I'm going to show you slides and a short film also of the Osaka Pavilion under construction. And really the theme, I think, tonight is not so much the individual buildings, but the nature of the architectural practice as a whole. I think it, it will be of value to you students and even the young faculty members to get some sense of how practice, in fact, is shaped and formed. It's been said, and I think it's true, that architecture mirrors accurately the civilization within which it is created. And uh, because the buildings and the environment that, is, that are built are surely a true reflection of the values of that society. Nevertheless, there is an interaction between the interests and ideals of the individual architect and those economic and social forces which uh, establish the field within which he works. It's only after looking back at our own work that we have begun to see some thread of consistency in the work, something which has given some shape to it as a total. Uh, as you're in the middle of working, many of the projects seem isolated, individual. But in looking back, I think we've discovered that there is the common thread is a commitment to those urban values which really come out of the city. Just a word about our practice. We started in 1950. I had two partners then. Uh, one of the partners is Lou Davis, is still a partner as of today that I have. We are the design partners. Uh, I have all three partners, all our associates, live in the city of New York now. We commute, that is by subway. We come to work every day in the heart of Manhattan. Our staff lives there. They come from all over the world. I think we feel we came to the city. None of us were native-born New Yorkers, but we came there originally because we were looking for that center of vitality, which was the city, and which I think traditionally has been the heart of our civilization. No matter what one hears of today about the decay of the city, the fact that it may be obsolete, impossible, problems to solve, I think we still find that there is that creative potential still possible to tap. When I say the city, I don't just mean New York. New York is where we practice. But I think the city means that coming together in an urban situation, no matter what size, where people work and live face to face. No matter how great our communications systems are, no matter how fast our transportation systems are, I don't think they will ever replace that bringing together of people face-to-face -face contact from a diverse background. This is what gives, I think, the spark of life to, to work and play. And it's been a struggle. It is a struggle. I don't think that the kind of architecture we're doing may indeed be transitional. Uh, it certainly not doesn't look back to the nostalgic uh, past, nor does it really try and deal with the utopian future. It deals with the problems as we find them today. And I think as you will all find them today when you go out into practice. Uh, enough said, I think we'll go right into the slides and we'll have a review of some of this work. For our first 10 years in New York, we didn't have a job in New York. <laughs> this was our first major job, and it's Riverbend Houses. 
It's a middle income cooperative in Harlem. The, the water you see below is the Harlem River. It's a Madison Avenue bridge there, and, the, and our project is the triangular project in front. This is a subsidized housing program, and if you look directly to the rear on the right, you'll see the typical kind of housing project which was produced by the acre in this kind of program. This was a combination of the urban, urban renewal in which all the existing neighborhood was knocked down and cleared, and new buildings were put up in a usually a cookie cutter mold with nondescript open spaces between buildings, sometimes filled with parking lots, sometimes filled with no walking signs. And that was it. Here we had a an unusual site. Many of the sites in the city are unusual because their land which becomes available, marginal land which becomes available. Uh, as you can see, on one side is a bridge approach. Through the middle is a ramp which connects to the Harlem River Drive going on the bottom. And so there were the triangular piece and, a, and another piece. When we started this project, uh, the approved plan was to pr put two high-rise towers in the triangular part, and the rest would be covered with parking. We felt this was a wrong approach to take. The street that comes down along the length of, the, of it is this is from the river. Is that focus that a little bit? At the top, you can see Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue, which is part of the grid system of Manhattan, sort of dies at the end into the Harlem River Drive. As so common in many cities, the edge this, the edge between the city and the waterfront has been cut off by commercial development or transportation systems. This is true here. We felt it was very important to stop the kind of nondescript uh, development which had been taking place that somehow the this piece of land created once again the sense of street, the sense of end, at a vital point of Fifth Avenue, the most northern portion of Fifth Avenue, and, and the possibility of creating a, an environment where people could relate, where there would be a hierarchy of spaces, both public and private. Here's a picture ramp going through. We put the cars in the first place underneath decks, which were covered over, then made available for play space. These were private tenant areas. The low buildings were duplex units with open galleries facing, in each case, the open space in the center. And as you can see, it's a very direct system of construction, one that we use in New York time and time again because it is the most economical uh, flat concrete, flat plate concrete construction, in this case with exposed spandrels and an infill of brick. Views were kept out to the river. Eventually we hope that the riverfront itself will become developed with park areas. These show the duplexes where there is a quick walk, then a front stoop, which you go up a few steps into a, a little private area uh, in front of the duplex unit, which goes vertically, the front door there. That's the a lobby core. The low units also tie into the higher flat units so that there's always there's movement between the two cores a 
section showing the arrangement of the duplex. There you can see that the public gallery is a few steps below the stoop, so that as you're on the stoop, you can actually see out and over and have privacy. The kitchen is right behind there, so that it can be used to serve directly for outdoor use, the living room facing the other way on the street side, and then two bedrooms generally up above. There are, various, there are many, many different variations of the apartments. We thought, again, that there should be a variety of apartment types so that uh, a, whole, a whole kind of uh, a, a choice would be uh, available to the viewer, to the users. This is just a uh, <coughs> view of something I think would be interesting. This is a, one, of the, one of the concrete block uh, lobbies which has been decorated afterwards. Uh, our relations were so good with the clients, who were the cooperators who actually bought these apartments, that uh, they wanted to identify themselves on their own floor. And people from our office worked with them in designing and painting a uh, super graphic kind of thing that they could all participate in. This was after the project was up several years. And we still have very good relations with them. These galleries have also become kind of outdoor spaces which are used for play as well as uh, circulation. As you can see, they begin to take on their own life as people have added plants, gates, little doodads. There's, when people take over, I think this, this adds to the life of the building. and. Uh, we're not, we don't feel that buildings should be so pure that they, that the individual imprint of families shouldn't begin to be seen. It's interesting that this arrangement has created a relatively safe environment compared to surrounding areas in, the Har in Harlem there. Uh, the crime rate and the vandalism rate are much lower in this project. Uh, I think this is a combination of the fact that it is a cooperative, that people own where they live, own the place where they live, but in addition, the physical design has made a difference. There's a sense of, of what is theirs, they identify with their space, they take responsibility for this kind of space, for the territoriality of it. This is along the street. As you see here, we've, uh, there are, there's a daycare center, there are stores which occur along the street front, and we, as, as I said before, deliberately tried to create the continuation of the street grid. Those little balconies, incidentally, are access balconies which are second means of egress from the duplex units. You have to have two means of egress from all structures, so there's a possibility of climbing from one apartment into the next for, another, for a second way out. As far as we know, this hasn't created any unusual social problems. Uh, most, of the, most of them become great planting boxes. People have planted materials there. Another view of the street. One other story, these, were, these benches are outside of obviously for public use. And uh, the cooperator, cooperators met, met when they took over. And these benches weren't in yet. And there were a group who felt that they shouldn't put any benches in because they didn't want people from out there hanging around their place. Uh, nevertheless, there was another group, and in the end, more powerful, who said that they did not want to become an isolated island in the middle of Harlem. They wanted to make some gesture towards the rest of the community, and they insisted that the benches did go ahead, and they have. At night, we have a uplighting system which lights off the soffits and makes, again, it, it, it seemed to be safe and secure. This was our second project. This was in, on, those of you who know New York, on 23rd Street, which is the main street going down this way. And it was the south end of a large urban renewal zone. For a change, the city uh, had a little more imagination in how they were proceeding with this urban renewal project. First of all, they kept a, uh, a group of existing institutions that were within the zone without tearing them down. Second, they phased the construction so that it would be possible for 
people to live on site and then move into the new uh, units as they, as they were built rather than having to leave the area. Our sponsor for this project here is the two towers low unit, uh, a variation again of the, of the river bend idea of towers connected to low units, uh, where local community groups, churches, synagogue, a PTA and a, and a local political group. And uh, again, this is middle income housing, it's cooperative, and they deliberately set a, a goal of, of subsidizing within their own uh, development a certain number of apartments to reach lower income people. Uh, so that we have, uh, in fact, a range of uh, rentals or what would be equivalent rentals from like $20 a room to $60 a room here. And there's no difference in apartment units. This is a site plan. Second phase, which is the red up above, is going ahead now. At that time, we will close the street and there'll be a public plaza which goes all the way through. As I say, this is the south end of a whole urban renewal zone and we are providing the beginning of a mid-block pedestrian movement uh, which will lead eventually to a new park which will be created within the urban renewal zone. So that you can be able to walk through and then under the building at the other end and then on through several of the other projects which are also being developed at that time. The red is our building, the yellow are existing institutions which have been kept. One is a church, the other is an institute for the disabled. And again, you can see the towers, the high units have been placed uh, to the east and west on the avenues and the low elements uh, connecting in between. Here again, it's not, it's not quite finished. The stores aren't in, but it, uh, all along 23rd Street, which was a busy, is a busy commercial crosstown street, we are providing stores on the ground floor. Uh, we feel the stores not only will help, the income from the stores will help subsidize the apartments, but in addition will provide the kind of activity, street activity and liveliness, which will make this kind of residential uh, development successful. This is the penetration, the beginning of the penetration through the mid-block. We're now on the court side. Here, this is uh, different from the Riverbend scheme in that we have open galleries, again, facing the courtyard side, but the private balconies are on the other side because they face south, and they are private in this case. We have a kind of amphitheater fountain which, uh, in which we light also from the top so that there can be water play during the summer. It can be occasional sort of uh, non-program dramatic events we hope will take place. This is all open to the public at this level. Above the stores, on their extension, we have private deck areas for the tenants and our laundries and play areas are on, on those at, at that second level. Again, this is the core. You can see how you come out. Uh, these galleries have in and out so that we did deliberately try and create, uh, instead of a straight gallery corridor, uh, areas which expand so that there, get, there can be real play occurring on these upper streets. One of the sad things of history is that uh, we planned this development around this church and as soon as we finished the church was knocked down uh, it was meant to have a major part on the plaza but in this case the parish did change there are inevitable changes when you get into large-scale urban renewal and uh, it was evidently no longer viable as a as a church we would have liked to have kept it at least as a community center but it was sold and knocked down before we had a chance to stop it. 
there it's gone. But you can see some of the uh, development on top of the roof levels of the extended uh, uh, stores, which are for the tenants. Here, as you get up and look down on the balconies, you can see the life that does indeed take place on them. Uh, balconies in New York have traditionally been made because they provide some mortgage money, but, but nobody ever uses them. Usually, they're so they're not private or they're not they don't feel very comfortable. We've always made our balconies solid for that very reason. They work when they're solid and they become real extensions of the interior space. They feel secure and they are private, generally from from street level. tying in of the formal problems of tying in the low and the high rise structure. The high ones are more standard kind of typical flat apartment flats. This is our third major housing project which is going on in New York now. This one we worked on for 10 years so far. It's just in construction. And it, uh, it really shows uh, development of a waterfront like Manhattan, the first one of its kind, and it's now become a prototype for a large amount of development along Manhattan's waterfront. Uh, there's been a zone between the bulk headline and the pier headline, which of course has been the past commercial zone for shipping, but as shipping has died out, these areas have potentially become land. a third major housing project which is going on in New York now. This one we worked on for 10 years so far. It's just in construction. And it, uh, it really shows uh, development of a waterfront of Manhattan, the first one of its kind, and which is now becoming a prototype for a large amount of development along Manhattan's waterfront. Uh, there's been a zone between the bulk headline and the pier headline, which of course has been in the past commercial zone for shipping, but as shipping has died out, these areas have potentially become land resources. The big flat building there, incidentally, is the UN school, which we did not do, but when we first planned this area and brought it to the, uh, to the uh, City Planning Commission's attention, they say almost 10 years ago, uh, we thought of this as being, a, again, a, a jointly developed kind of area, not just housing, but housing and recreation and institutional, uh, uh, creating a whole new life and providing and, and utilizing the resource of this new land without relocation to provide new facilities for rejuvenating existing neighborhoods. This is down near Bellevue Hospital, which you can see right behind it. The big block is a new, one of the new buildings for Bellevue Hospital. This is office from goes from about 25th Street to 30th Street at the point, and there are four towers. They again, the program here is su subsidized housing, uh, but in this case, will go to, from high middle income to low income. One building will be uh, built under a different program, federal programs, uh, the one on the far right, which is just beginning to be started, and will have uh, be as low as, again, $20 a room, whereas some of the high buildings and townhouses will be at $100 a room. So it's mixed uh, income and, will, of course, will be mixed racially as, our, as the last project was, too. Here is what it was before. It was just an old pier uh, and open water, and that is the edge of the 
spearhead line. Uh, we had to have a congressional act passed in order to be able to use this land because uh, the soap is land, is water, because the rivers are controlled by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, in an old act, they have, the, they have the right in time of emergency to knock anything down that's built between the pierhead line and the bulkhead line. So in fact, the act had to be changed to bring the bulkhead line out to the, what is now the new, uh, which was the existing pierhead line. And this is the model of the development. We did not use fill, uh, although the UN school which went in first did. We are convinced that the the, the economic way to do it was to build platforms. Piles were sunk into the river, special piles. Research was developed so that piles could be made, which could be guaranteed to last for as long as anybody could uh, expect reasonably and could still be repaired if necessary. Combination of concrete and steel. And then we used precast concrete deck system, which fell onto pile caps and built the whole platform. The platform itself was designed to take the various construction loads of cranes, moving cranes, and loading materials. Here's a site plan. On the right, you can see a pedestrian bridge which goes across the East River Drive. Again, we're separated from the existing community by a major driveway. One of the problems is how to, how to get across, how to make the connections to the city. These are difficult planning problems. We, create our own service road and loop. We will have a, a bus uh, which will come down 23rd Street and around to the project, dropping off and then uh, going one way, never going onto the actual drive traffic, but always on service roads. We expect to build another bridge connecting through to Bellevue, which is having a master plan executed now. And again, uh, to, to concentrate people, to bring them into a day and night kind of activity uh, so that uh, safety and amenities can be provided. All the area you see uh, on white and the main levels is open to the public, uh, so it will become a real resource to the public at large. Along the waterfront, on the deck level, there'll be commercial uh, facilities all along that main plaza level. In the front here, we hope to have restaurants, seafood restaurants, of course, bars, uh, theaters. We're still hoping for a health club. And the buildings in the background are townhouses on the left here. And they, the tenants have, have on the upper level of the, again, of the, the roof of the shops will be private tenant space that they can have their own turf also play areas, promenades, and so forth. These are the plans, and I show them to you simply to illustrate the uh, how off a of basic planning for we can get uh, a, a variety of massing simply by the extension off the corners of, uh, of additional space as the building goes up. Not only does this provide for a more uh, a, a play with the masses themselves, a play with the graphic quality of the windows which can shift, but in fact it gives us the possibility of providing for uh, a various distribution of apartment types uh, within a very economical scheme and uh, because of, of one base plan we can we can vary the corners so that as you can see in the upper floors we have three bedroom units in the corner by adding a cantilever in, in the corner uh, as opposed to the lower levels which have two different kinds of two bedroom units one with dining area and one with a smaller two again this allows for a variety of apartments and rents It's actually the same building, but turned in each case, each corner becoming different.
We hope that the whole riverfront to the south of this will also be developed in similar ways and that new connections to the upland area will be made. You can see that the water has been used as part of the construction technique through the use of barges, uh, bringing material, and also we use them for pile driving. I think you'll agree that the views will be quite spectacular from here, looking up and down the river. And uh, at least we'll be exploiting the benefits, some of the benefits of high rise living in New York. Night view. Here's another river site. In this, this case, this is the Harlem River. And the project I'm talking about, if you can see this construction up in the middle on the right side of the river there. Uh, it's called Harlem River Park Houses, and it's combined with a new state park, which is being built along the river. Again, you'll see that the, that area of the river has been cut off from use by the highway and by the railroad in this case. Between the highway and the railroad is almost as wide as a river, forming a barrier to the use of these sites, which have been all along very marginal uh, use of sort of low-grade industrial kind of development, mostly junkyards. Here's a plan. There was an existing bridge on the right, and that area just above it is a new park, which will be an active, actively programmed park, uh, having gym, amphitheater, swimming pool, both indoor and outdoor. This is designed by Paul Friedberg. Uh, the housing is in red, and uh, yellow is a school. We worked the master plan with Paul to try and figure some way to activate both the park and the housing. And we felt that they should go together and that this might be a prototype for the development of whole new node, nodes on the Harlem River to help rejuvenate the whole river. The valley, the Harlem River Valley is really very beautiful. I don't know if you remember or noticed, but there was a beautiful green park on the other side. And there's still bits of that to their left. It could all be brought back to be great resource again to the city. Here we indicated a school to be built over air rights of the railroad and a new bridge which we're building as part of the housing. Again, this is to, to tie the new development to the existing neighborhood. We hope the school itself will become a, uh, an important meeting ground between the new neighbor, the new people and the people living there. And uh, of course we have a circulation problem of bringing something like 1,600 people, 1,600, not people, 1,600 family units uh, to this housing, which is highly dense. It's tall, it's dense. It's also moderate income. It's, it's sponsored by the Urban Development Corporation, which is a state agency for developing moderate income housing. This is for families in the eight to $10,000 a year income range. That's what the site looked like before, you can see that it's, it is junkyard on the right side. Here on the left, you can see the, the park potential. These are buildings which have developed from the same, similar ideas of, that we used at the waterside, the uh, change in mass, uh, the distribution of apartments by utilizing those corner configurations, uh, the change in window patterns as the apartment plants change and the clustering into a faceted hole. Here on the side, you see the garage element, which will also on the plaza level have commercial areas directly available for local service shopping. New bridge on the right and the school up off further to the right there. Under construction now. Another kind of problem in the city. This is a mid-block, but with a rather special relationship because it's to an open park, it's a cathedral parkway, and to the top, at the top is the cathedral St. John the Divine, which is a very nice building. Uh, we wanted to keep our building certainly lower than that, uh, yet we had density problems to, to meet in order to make the program economically viable. Again, this is for the UDC. It's a subsidized housing for moderate income families. 
we utilized a, a low building on the on the street which would face low units and we could a higher building which had the open space the park north of it we provided a public walkway through again a mid-block movement right opposite it at the other end is an entrance to the park a very nice park which is maintained by the parish of st john's uh, by the parish house As you can see, again, variations on the, on the themes that we have established in our other housing. This has daycare center, which is part of it, which, again, the daycare center, the tenants, and public all have their own turf, which can be separated or can be put together as required. This is also under construction now. This is a project in the South Bronx, which is right next to the zoo, Bronx Zoo on the right. Here we have dealt with an entirely different scale. Uh, these are all six, five, six, four, five, and six story buildings, and they're built like the oldest construction system in the world, bearing walls, masonry bearing walls, and wood, wood joists. Uh, we're able to build this way in New York up to a certain height, and uh, Usually the kind of buildings you see are farther up uh, with fire escapes. They're old tenement kind of buildings. We try to take that same old technology, which does produce economical buildings, and eliminate the fire escapes. We did that by utilizing duplexes so that we could get internally solve the problem of two means of egress into fire corridors. We also like the idea of dealing with a low scale since it was at the edge of the Bronx Zoo and we and it also fit well into the existing height pattern of the neighborhood. This is an FHA 221 D3 program which again is for low income people. We tried to create in each each unit a private court, interior court which would be safe for small children to play, which could be controlled as a, as a zone, and yet still reflect the street pattern in some way so that we did not, did not simply become leftover spaces on the street. Here, I, I, you may have noticed that all through our projects we've been using a large size brick, which we developed on, the, on Riverbend originally. Uh, we were convinced that it could be done more economically and could be useful in terms of this as a scale element, which would be different than the old red brick projects. Uh, it has turned out very economically. We use an eight by eight, an eight by six. Uh, sometimes we call it the tile in order to get it through the building department, but the masons have learned to uh, live with it and it has become quite popular. In this case, we have a through wall, one wide brick. Uh, that is, we, you, you just lay down one brick, which is eight inches deep, 10 inches high and eight inches wide and it's extruded so that it has a handhold and masons can handle it very easily. Uh, sort of again, uh, it's an old idea which has been brought back and it's turned out to be useful and economical. These are just being finished. Uh, I just brought these along to show the kind of scale. As the landscape grows, we think, you know, these, these buildings will, will become very quiet background buildings. This is a public housing job. Uh, I guess this is the one agency where I'm not sure we could go through another fight. Uh, it takes too much out of you. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately a bureaucracy which started 30, 40 years ago with a, a very good aims to produce public housing. Uh, but the whole point of view now is that uh, don't make any housing too good because the people who live there really don't deserve it. Somehow that's gotten built into the program. And uh, we you had to fight for everything because whatever you wanted to do, they would say, well, you know, we tried it once or we don't like to do that or these are the standards. Nevertheless, we've got a building which we think does work, does, does deal with architecture and the problems of urban space. Uh, 
even on a strange site. Again, we seem to be st stuck with triangles most of our lives. Uh, this is, again, a very sort of narrow triangle in the middle of nowhere in the Bronx. But uh, it was interesting to talk topographically. You had rock on it, it was high on one side. Uh, and we had the opportunity to deal, to deal with a little community center, which was also part of the program. Here again, we went from one bedroom apartment to two bedroom apartments. Can't leave them out at the top. There are very fine views, really, from these apartments up high. Again, the oversized brick, six by eight in this case. Public sitting areas out on the street. A lot of elderly people will live here. We found that a lot of them don't, do not want to be in private, quiet parks. They want to be out on the street watching where the action is. The other side, we simply exposed some of the rockets and blasted them away. Another kind of problem in the city. This was a straight commercial building, but built over an unusual site. Over the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks, uh, the big cut, uh, as just before you come into the station, those of you who have come into the, to the, by the railroad, you come under the tunnel, through the tunnel underneath the river, and then you come out into a large cut. This was for air right space, which was not being used. Someone had the idea of making a warehouse distribution center, large loft space areas, which are hard to find uh, in Manhattan and which would serve as, uh, as I say, mainly distribution centers for, problem, for uh, soft wood houses. Uh, here you can see that it's built over the tracks, a tricky construction problem because the main line went through here and this had to be built uh, uh, so that the trains were never stopped from moving. High voltage wires, when we were putting the steel up, I guess it could have all been fused if anybody touched one of those lines. Girders, 12 foot deep girders, which spanned in three spans over the track, and then a concrete structure above that. These were precast concrete panels, uh, which were designed either to be used for warehouse floors or flipped over for office floors. It's turned out that the space is uh, even more valuable for sort of backup office space, and uh, it's being used more for office space than it is for warehousing. On top is a skating rink. As you can see, the ground floor was all designed for truck off-street truck loading docks. And the shape comes from a simple response to the New York zoning law, which requires setbacks. So instead of making a series of short set setbacks or even large ones, we simply follow the zoning envelope very directly. An urban problem, our first office building, uh, which we've done in, in association with Emory Roth. Uh, this is downtown in the middle of Wall Street. The main interest here is that uh, in the trading that goes on as to how much building you can build on any given zoning plot, you get certain benefits by having setbacks for plazas. Uh, it made no sense down in Wall Street area where a, a, a plaza is sort of meaningless, especially in a small plot. And instead, we were able to convince the city that if we provided a galleria, an open public galleria in which you could move through the building, leading from a subway stop to the upper right to a, here is a plaza and to the uh, uh, Chase Manhattan and the Federal Reserve building down here, on the lower left, in other words, a natural pedestrian route, if we could produce that, that we ought to be able to get some more space, allowable space for our client. Uh, they, they did agree, and so he was able to get a certain amount of extra square footage that he could build his uh, office space, and in turn, is creating 
this plaza, which goes up to five stories in the center and down below. Uh, one stipulation by the city was that we had to uh, have stores all around this plaza. In other words, to provide, again, a kind of activity which is badly needed in that area. These are model shots, just mock-ups to show you something of the quality. The escalator leads directly up to this main tenant's lobby, a uh, uh, life insurance company. But the, at the grade level will be, as I say, stores and down below. Eventually, we may have a subway connection in, at the lower level also. One more kind of project that you find in a city and working in the city, uh, making over something that's already there. This is, uh, believe it or not, a campus, a college campus. This is Long Island University, Brooklyn campus. And it's really a found campus. On the right is the old Brooklyn Paramount building, which they took over and made into gymnasium and classroom spaces. There's an old automobile showroom. And the frame there was a loft building, which was there. It would have, uh, we figured it would have cost more to knock down and to uh, rebuild than to simply try and reuse in some way. We needed to build a humanities and uh, arts center. And so we stripped down the frame and created a new building. Uh, I think it's Uh, which is, again, a classroom, combined classroom and faculty office building. It's the first new building or uh, on, the, on the campus which we're working on now to bring a cohesive plan. A new library is going in this, in this area where we're going, where I'm uh, in front of the picture now, which will connect all the existing buildings. We added on the front and back those elements which you see up above are either fan rooms, lounges, or uh, student lounges and faculty lounges. And the two, the vertical elements at the corners are new stairs which have been added to create the required vertical circulation. At the rear, we added a, uh, uh, an element combining lecture hall and dining facility. There's a section. The building had so much inherent strength because of uh, the fact that it was an old loft building that we were able to add a, a whole floor on top, which was an art, uh, art studios. And uh, we arranged it so that the elevator would be that students would only have one stop between classes. They would go up from the first to the sixth floor and then walk up or down one level. And the first three levels were student floors, and then in between those were the faculty floors. So uh, uh, the uh, elevators could be made manageable. Studio floor, classroom made out of one of the old spaces. This is a, not in the city, but in a way it's combined, it's taken all our interest in solving problems in the city and solving a new problem, which was, in fact, uh, I guess almost a new city out at Amherst, New York. This is part of the new Buffalo campus for the State University of New York. Uh, this is just one part of it. This represents six so-called colleges. And uh, eventually, this whole university will have something like 30,000 students. But here, we'll have uh, 6,000 students, uh, approximately 3,000 who will live in and 3,000 who will commute. Uh, this is not part of the main campus. The main campus is south of here. Uh, and, of course, the notion is to try and create uh, a breakdown into a smaller component so that people can identify uh, something this large with a place that they can call their own. Each of these colleges was originally to have uh, both faculty, married students, uh, undergraduates, graduate students, all living together. There would be a master in each one. And each, hopefully, each college was, uh, would begin to have some particular flavor because of the interest of the students and the faculty who were associated with it. Uh, there are a certain, uh, about 25% of the academic space was actually going to be provided here in this 
uh, in this six college group of, uh, away from the central campus so that a number of classes could be taken here and a certain number of facilities would be placed here. And in the center, you can see that there's a theater and a uh, lecture hall, interaction, drama group, and there are libraries and classroom spaces. We really designed it as a compact city. This was sort of out in the middle of nowhere in what was really a swamp at the time. And uh, we had to solve basic circulation system, which is a road way down below with parking off it, service to each one of these. A pedestrian level of plazas, which uh, you could walk to and, and go to the hard court, hard court surface of each of these colleges. And then these were dormitory units, which were set in soft uh, areas. As you can see, here's soft ground as the, as the building grows out to the grounds, more street-like and harder surface as we go into the connections with the other buildings. A section, you can see the roadway, service roadway at the lower left, uh, classrooms, library in the center, outdoor uh, plaza area up on the up, upper right there, and, that, and then a, a, a green court or yard which is surrounded by the L-shaped building. By making it compact, we were able to really save a lot of the ground around it, which would be useful for games and open space. The lake is created new in order to get us out of the swamp. We dug the lake and used the fill to, uh, to raise the level of land. And of course, then the lake itself becomes a, not only it solves a drainage problem, but becomes a resource which will be used both for summer and winter. It's uh, designed as a, obviously with a component system of, of parts, and yet each one is, is different as a variation on the theme of constant parts. Like this is some more like the fate we hope it'll have when it's finished in full landscape. A kind of a hill town and uh, compact so that you can get out of it into the countryside when you want. Within it itself, wherever you are, there's a, a small scale which is created by the very many little courtyards that are within it. Uh, this is a change. <laughs> From our cities, we had the opportunity to uh, enter a competition for the American Pavilion. Like an air pumpkin. Uh, at that time, I guess we were really thinking more of what is the external shape that an air structure would carry, and we were trying to exploit that shape as something very large. The idea that went with this was that you would go up into a structure inside, and the in this would be a double walled structure, not translucent, and the interior surfaces of this uh, giant super elliptical shape, ellipsoid, whatever it would be, would be covered with images, uh, movies and slides, and the, uh, the illusion we felt would be uh, great because you would be dealing with uh, 360 degree surfaces to work on. We won the competition on this, but then soon found that it was impossible to achieve with any, within any kind of budget that anybody could conceive at that time. As you can see, you would be walking on these things and there would be images outside. So step two, cut it down into four smaller, uh, slightly more than hemispheres. Again, double walled. You went up into it and you you uh, stood on vertical arrangement, and then we're within uh, again that's 180 degree uh, surface. 
which movies would be shown. These would be stage movies, so there would be no wait. In other words, every five minutes a new show would be occurring in each one of the uh, four hemispheres. This is just a view showing down in the center that there would be additional exhibits hung in there while you were waiting to go into your movie experience. Well, about a, I think slightly over a year before we uh, were supposed to produce this thing, Congress passed the actual money bill, which was $10 million. Out of the $10 million, we had $4 million to spend. Uh, a million and a half for the structure, and two and a half million, uh, two and a half million dollars for the structure, and a million and a half for the exhibits, which we had to produce completely, including shipping it over insurance and knocking it down afterwards. The other amount of money went to uh, administration. So uh, we had to come up with something which was obviously radically different. And we ended up with a net air structure, translucent, and I think really a much better solution than the ones we played with before. Uh, This is the view of it, and uh, as it's complete. I think we can start the movie now. It was an air structure used at the groundbreaking ceremony of a different kind. The old, I'm sure you've all seen the bubbles now. Basically, the difference here is that this is a cable-restrained air structure. It's like a net, a giant tennis racket with cables strung across it to a, a ring, a funicular ring. The ring takes compression and simply rests on the uh, uh, stabilized earth. That's the material that's then attached to the net. A berm was created, stabilized it, and then it's simply blown up. It's a marvelous structure. Uh, and as you see, the tension goes into the ring. And one of the great things is it's a very poor soil. Most of the buildings had to have piles. This is so light, simply by stabilizing the earth into these berms, we, could, we had no piles. We simply built the concrete ring uh, right in place on top of it, and that was enough. The structure had to be designed for both earthquakes and typhoon winds. And uh, we had not only tests, which went through 200 mile an hour winds, but in fact, it did go through a number of storms. The shape is a super ellipse. And it's a, uh, it's actually a, a, a curve which lies between a square and an, and an ellipse. Not a square, a rectangle and an ellipse. It's a, the mathematics of the curve really have been relatively recently discovered, but it works out very well. Uh, the cable system is such that the whole, this is, this, as I say, this is absolutely funicular ring. The uh, tensions which are put into it uh, are such that they all uh, always balance each other. As you can see, really the technology isn't that much different from housing. It's the same old building of forms and pouring the concrete and placing the uh, reinforcing and a lot of labor. These are uh, tubes which have to be placed within the ring so that where the cables are actually brought through. And that must be very accurately placed. The design of the structure uh, was done on uh, one of the two largest computers in the country. And uh, obviously, could never have been designed before we became the computer age, aside from the technology of fabrics and cables.
after the ring was uh, built up and a platform was uh, erected inside so that the cables and roof could be brought in easily, it's a very delicate job to bring the cables in because it was important not to kink them in any way. They had to be uh, kept loose and smooth. Inside, you also see the structure which was built up for the actual uh, exhibit platforms, simple bolted steel construction, and then the platform was put in. All the crossing points where the cables met and had to be tied were, were again uh, developed by the computer, marked and, and attached uh, within one one hundredth of an inch. Then it was pulled into the ring, plugged, and then jacked, and uh, set to the exact dimension. Here on the left, you can see we made tests of all the various kinds of joints, test of failure. Uh, we really had to satisfy uh, almost a complete, do a complete thesis to get by the Japanese uh, authorities who wanted to be proved everything. Luckily, we worked with an excellent contractor whose testing laboratories were able to convince everybody from fire tests to individual component stress tests. Here is a system, this is back in the a hanger which was used to sew, or not sew, to heat, uh, assemble all these, all this fabric, which is a fiberglass coated with vinyl. 100,000 square feet of material were assembled in one piece, folded up on one truck, and as you saw, lifted to the job, and then unloaded, like there's it is, on one truck. Roller skates were put on back, upside down on the, uh, uh, thing. And then, of course, the guys had to go in there <laughs> underneath and work. These are temporary tie downs at the ends. We have developed more sophisticated techniques, let's say, now for, for tying the fabric to the cable system. There on the right, you can see the, the beginning of the ceiling of the whole edge. And uh, the final tie-down system, which was shot into the ring. The outer surface of the berm was covered with a simple uh, asphalt block tile that the Japanese made, which was cheap. Uh, the big moment's coming. Uh, all systems grow, hopefully. I don't think anybody expected this thing to go up and stay up. Uh, it had never been done before. <laughs> the Japanese had never done it. We certainly haven't. And but, and of course, you know, it is, it is really a magical structure. It's really just a very small fan, which in the end lifts that, all, that up, makes it stay up.
the differential in pressure from inside to outside is such that, first of all, you can't notice it, but it's about the difference between the ground level of a building and the eighth or ninth floor of a building. That's all it is. Uh, this is the trickiest time in erection. It, only, it went up in about three hours, but if a big wind comes while you're in this stage, you're in trouble. After it's fully inflated, if you walk on the ribs, they're as hard as uh, rock. And it's, there's no movement at all. In the intermediate part, it's uh, like a wonderful trampoline. That's a relief air vents. We had those built in to uh, allow for change of air within. The, of course, the air conditioning system and the inflation system are combined. Although we we had to be, uh, more air conditioning was required than inflation air. <coughs> Many tests were built into the structure. Everybody was curious, especially the Japanese, of how it performed. And it performed, you know, according to theoretical calculations within uh, a very, very uh, close, very, very close to the theoretical, theoretically predicted movements in the ring, in the cables, in the actual stresses. It's, you know, it's a fantastic space once it opens up. It's hard to believe. The color on the right is really closer. This is yellowish, but it's, uh, the translucence is about 10% in this kind of uh, fiberglass vinyl. And there really is a wonderful light inside, a very live light, because uh, it, 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 it is part of the atmosphere outside. As any change occurs outside, the light, the light changes feel you're in the medium of light. Queuing line on the right over here. Cover the inside of the berm with a reflective mylar kind of sheet, plastic sheet, which uh, helped create light. That's the moon rock, which became a stumbling, uh, uh, a traffic problem until we set it up high enough. Everybody could see. We hadn't realized it would be so popular. These are the nozzles with, for the air supply system, which go around in the ring, and both supply air conditioning as well as the inflation air. It does glow at night.
these are two plans showing the simply the uh, system of construction within it. Once we had the basic bowl shape, uh, we, we said we built two levels of exhibition platform in a very simple system. Uh, upper and lower, we have to provide exits through tunnels through the berms and uh, there's a movement system through coming in higher, going down low, and then ending up over a moving ramp out. You can see in this section uh, that there's a space also built below, which was a service area for USIA administration and uh, mechanical space. We'd hoped that they could use it afterwards. It's supposed to, this was to be a site for a city, and it would make a beautiful amphitheater, not an amphitheater, but a, a bowl for sports or something, simply by cleaning out the center. Uh, and putting seats on the sides. Unfortunately, uh, uh, since this was plugged into a central air conditioning, they would have had to create their own plant, and the local prefecture decided uh, that it was too expensive to do. So it's been dismantled. Well, once you have an idea like that, it's hard to go back to, to housing in the city. <laughs> we started thinking, what, what could we do with this kind of structure? It really seemed to uh, offer all kinds of possibilities. Uh, these are sort of beginning of fantasy drawings. Uh, use the berm, as you can see. This becomes uh, a parking area and a whole sort of town center. Uh, then we actually, for fun, took a program that we'd actually worked with, a, a science building that we'd act, that we had done, and we took that science building and redesigned it in an air structure to see if there were any. Uh, any, any, any special qualities that could be gotten out of it that would be uh, make it a, perhaps a better kind of building to build than the conventional one. Uh, there were certain notions of, not notions, but uh, mechanical advantages that we could begin to get through simplified air systems of distribution, especially in the science building, because you supply air in the center and we uh, simply draw it back through the spaces and through the exhaust hoods. Uh, this simply shows a way of having outside spaces, uh, spaces which are controlled completely environmentally on, on, the, on the back. And uh, uh, we established the basic feasibility. It could be done. We also studied other kinds of building types. Uh, it need not be simply a, an elliptical ring. The shape could, could take on other shapes. Uh, uh, this is uh, a possibility for an industrial building which we designed for materials handling through the use of cranes inside, which could reach, utilizing the clear span uh, possibilities of this sort of structure. More abstractly, you know, uh, could it be a, a town, a town center of some kind? Uh, what would be the nature of such a place be? Could you build differently? Would it be worth doing? What would be the, really the, uh, the social aspects of such an environment? Here's an obvious uh, answer to a large stadium cover. Well, no one's asked us to do one yet, but it uh, can be done. We're convinced it can be done very economically, more economically than any of the other uh, closure systems that have been developed. The competition we entered, some of you probably did too. This was for the uh, uh, this Beaubourg competition in Paris for a museum and art center in the middle of Paris. And here the idea was to make a series of outdoor outdoor kind of exhibition areas which would be in a hopefully transparent enclosure facing uh, the old historical part of Paris on this one side. We did not win. But uh, it was interesting to go through the exercise of can this kind of building be adapted for an urban uh, an urban setting? Is it possible? We talked about office space, uh, possible organization, you know, in different plan kind of shapes. Uh, again, here we we actually had the chance. Uh, close chance of really working on a, on a commission for an office building. Somebody that almost was crazy enough to do it, unfortunately didn't end up doing it, but this would be an office building where they had projected expansion uh, over a number of years to the year 2000. 
and uh, they had everything. They had. They seemed like to be the perfect kind of client to try something like this. They had large acreage outside of the city uh, in a northern climate, and we began to find that there were really possibilities of tremendous energy savings in this kind of system. In fact, you begin to use the Earth as a heat sink, and uh, we were able to save something like 40 percent of the heat loads. Uh, so another element of interest in the whole idea of encapsulated space is the possibility of, of you know, saving energy, which I think is going to become a more and more important uh, problem that architects, are, architects and planners are going to deal with. Uh, obviously, as you deal with one large container, uh, you don't, you're not dealing with a series of small individual buildings with many, many surfaces uh, required to provide that, that skin. And uh, utilize the suns, you, you gain from the suns uh, rays, you can store heat, you can store uh, coldness too in the climate. It works really better in the extremer climates rather than in the temperate ones. So up north or in the desert, it would work very well. We got into, with this particular client, the possibilities of a, an office space which would really be built uh, on a system inside which could be expanded at any time. Questions came up, living in such an environment, uh, you need for some biological relief to look out perhaps at times that we might accomplish by the translucent panels in the ceiling or, or through the wall in some way. Uh, systems of construction which could be stacked up inside, uh, ready to assemble as components. Obviously, a landscape setting for a landscape office kind of space. Again, you could have a variety of kinds of spaces, those which are, could exist completely out in the open, those which need more and more environmental control. But the whole construction of such elements, of course, would be much cheaper than building them outside because they don't have wind loads, they don't have all the problems of connections and tightness to weather that are normally required. And all, they can be built at any time, day or night, winter or summer, within the encapsulated space. Uh, no sense in thinking small, so we began to uh, decide what could be done with an 8,000 foot uh, diameter. First of all, could it be done? Structurally, it could be. It's interesting that these, these uh, structures become more economical the larger they are. But when a structure is this side, you can have uh, an opening in it that would be big enough for actually a, a, a B-52 to fly through and the, and the structure would not come down. Uh, it, the thermal dynamic properties, when they get so big, uh, means that they almost stay up automatically. You practically hardly have to pump air in them. Uh, the, the technology has advanced quite a bit to new kinds of fabrics, Teflon, which would, Teflon films, uh, uh, in double layers uh, combined with fiber, uh, either fiberglass or some perhaps stainless steel wires and cable, uh, so that these could be equivalent to permanent structures, no longer temporary structures. Is there a reason to do it? Well, I think, uh, don't know. There could be. This simply suggests that, and again, uh, in our best investigation of an 8,000-foot laboratory city, uh, you could actually create different local climates within it. We hope to sell this to the bicentennial people as an experiment worthy of our times. Uh, at that scale, you can actually hang a whole transportation system from the cables. There's so much, uh, uh, they're so strong at that time because there's so much tension that you can hang very heavy loads from them, including the whole, uh, say, cable car, so to speak. Uh, obviously, this would be, uh, you know, some kind of paper city be built and rebuilt again within some systems, stadia within. And finally, where our problems get too much on Earth, we, we have an idea for going to the moon. And uh, that's it. Thank you.